Welcome everyone for this uh, seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Laura Buscas today, who is going to be our speaker. So Laura has done her um, um, studies in, uh, in France, in Strasbourg. She has done a, a, a double master course in geophysics and astronomy or astrophysics. And then she, uh, she came to the Max Planck Institute in, uh, for radio astronomy in Bonn, where I was a postdoctoral researcher at that time. And then she started her PhD thesis with me, and she is uh, this close to finish um, and submit her, her thesis. And that, that's what she's going to talk, uh, talk about. Thank you, Timia. So hi, everybody. Uh, so today I will talk about um, the molecular diversity in early stage uh, high mass protostars. Um, so just to put in context, uh, the high mass star formation and why is it important to study the molecular uh, diversity. So high mass stars are forming in uh, distant clouds and it's extremely, it's difficult to, to study them, especially the, um, the early stages where, um, uh, where the, the, the protostars are formed. Um, here you have the, the, star for, uh, the high mass star formation um, sequence. And here you can see already the hot uh, molecular core. So this stage is still early in the star formation process, but um, you can see that you have many molecules. It's where we find the most, um, where we find abundant uh, complex organic molecules, um, complex being from uh, six atoms and uh, heavier. Um, however, we don't know how we reach this uh, this uh, this stage, and this is like this is what we want to study. So, first of all, I told you that we want to arrive to the hot uh, core stage. Therefore, we looked for precursors of hot cores, and the Sparks project uh, from Timea is an ALMA project um, in the 0.8 millimeter band. And uh, it targeted uh, the largest sample of most massive early stage uh, protostellar envelopes. They are all within five kiloparsecs, so they're not too far away. And uh, with, the, uh, with ALMA, we could uh, resolve them. However, the ALMA observations are only 7.5 gigahertz uh, bandwidth. So this is limited, especially to do um, a full molecular um, inventory. So um, the, the targeted sources are from this spark survey, but we didn't target the, all, uh, the, the whole sample. What we did, we selected the isolated and uh, non-fragmented um, sources. Like this, we can target them with a single dish and we don't have any confusion on the um, line emission. What we, what we did is um, with Apex, we observed a large bandwidth we, um, and um, towards these six sources. However, as you can see on this figure is that um, with Apex, you don't resolve uh, the emission. Assume that you don't know where the, the emission is coming from, it, if it is from the warm gas, the cold gas, the accretion shots of the outflow. However, um, I will show you later that uh, we succeeded uh, to do that. And um, like this, we could uh, study the physics of the gas, also the chemical composition of the gas and uh, separate the warm and cold gas. And we will try to see a chemical evolution uh, uh, in the sample. So the question that we wanted to answer with this was, um, what are the physical properties in the gas at the emergence of the hot cores? And how do we reach the complexity that we see in hot cores? So we uh, present here the observations. Um, we covered between 159 gigahertz and 374 gigahertz with the APEX telescope. And here you have the spectra of one of the, um, of the sources and you see that we have a rich molecular emission. This um, was done with only one telescope. So here we have a, a beam of 39 arc second and here a beam of 16 arc second, um, which makes a difference, but helped us to, to put even more constraints on our models. The, um, 
So first, uh, I will study one object. I told you that we have six sources. I will study one object, and we will go to the larger sample after that to um, and see a uh, sample in, in a broader content. So the first object that I will present is G328. Um, this, uh, this object was studied with the Sparks data by, by Timia, and you see that you have a collimated outflow. You have, um, and you have here um, different uh, so gas distribution depending on the molecule. So with the cyanides, you trace the warm uh, component of the envelope. It's, um, it's compact here, you see. And the overing molecules uh, show you these two uh, spots, which corresponds to two accretion shots. Therefore, on this source, we had, um, we had we knew the, the internal structure of the warm gas, and we could um, try to, to find um, some characteristics of these accretion shocks in the apex uh, data. So G328, this is the spectra on um, between 252 gigahertz and 256. And you can see that we have many lines. What we did is that we identified all the lines in the, in the spectral survey, and um, we could reach the molecular richness of G328. So this is uh, uh, all the species that we detect with the apex spectral survey. And the S-bearing molecules and the COMs are the, um, the largest groups. Um, this, we also have uh, many deuterated molecules here. And, what, um, and you see that also we have several ions already in G328. So, now that we have the molecular richness of the source, and we, we could do LTE modeling for, uh, the, um, for all these molecules. So with the LTE modeling, we were able to determine the excitation temperature of each molecule, uh, also the, um, the column density and the size of the emission. So here, is a sketch of the, of the protostar. And what you can see is that with the excitation temperature and the mean line width of all the molecules, we can distribute the, um, the molecules into two groups. Uh, the first group is here. This is the cold envelope. So the excitation temperature is below 50 Kelvin. And we also have a small line width, approximately four to five uh, uh, kilometer per second on average. And then we have a warmer envelope here, which is characterized by um, a temperature above 50 Kelvin and a larger li line width, typically uh, eight kilometer per second. Here, I do not show the accretion shocks that I told you about. We can see uh, they are spectrally resolved and they have um, a certain um, kinematics, but uh, I won't go in much detail here. So now that we distributed the molecules in the cold and warm envelope, I come back to this table and you see that in the comps, we have several comps in the cold um, envelope. So it means that the comps which were on the grains uh, dissolved through non-thermal um, processes. Uh, of, like, we find also some only in the warm gas, uh, and we have here one exception, which is only in the cold uh, envelope. Then we have the S-bearing molecules, which are mainly in the, in the cold uh, gas. And uh, it's similar to the deuterated uh, molecules, except for HDO, that we find in the, in, the warm, uh, in the warm gas. So I also told you that uh, the S-bearing molecules have the... Um, um, we have many S-bearing molecules. And when we study their molecular abundances from the column densities that we determined from um, the LTE modeling, we see that we have higher abundances in the hot gas. However, we have more species in the cold gas. So it means that we have, um, 
we have the, the, the chemistry is more evolved in the in the cold gas. However, in the hot gas, we still had a bit of chemistry because we formed, for example, SO2, which is here, and it's formed in large amount. So the chemistry still had time to uh, to take place, but it's less evolved than in the in the cold gas. We can also uh, look at uh, the abundances uh, in the cold and uh, warm gas, but in the cold, um, we find uh, 10 to the power of minus eight or 10 to the power of minus seven, even for some species. And this is one to two orders of magnitude higher than what we find in protostars, which means that we have more um, S-bearing molecules in the warm, uh, in the gas compared to, to hot cores. So it means that they, dissolved from the grains. And um, this is uh, most probably coming for, from a shock chemistry. So possibly from the outflow of from another shock. Even that we don't have um, um, spatial resolution, we cannot uh, determine exactly the, the origin of this. So now the deteriorated uh, molecules, um, we have um, several deteriorated molecules, and we also have the non-deteriorated forms of these molecules. Therefore, we could do a D over H ratio, and the points on G328 are in blue here, and you can see that um, for almost all the molecules, they are lower than for TMC1 and IRAS uh, 16293. Uh, IRAS 16293 is a hot corino, and uh, TMC1 is a, is a dark cloud. So um, having a lower deterioration ratio um, means that the chemistry was different. And the chemistry of deuterium is happening at low temperature. So it means that it was less efficient in, in our um, object. And therefore, that uh, have, either we had a higher temperature during the cold stage, either we had less time to have this chemistry. So therefore we can see with the de um, deuterium chemistry that we had a short crystallar stage or higher temperature during this stage. Uh, now we have uh, the isotopic um, ratios. Because we had a large bandwidth, we could have several transitions of each rare isotopologues in uh, this object. We treated each isotopologue with um, the same procedure and than the other molecules, and we treated them independently to check that they had the same temp gas temperature and also that they had the same um, uh, size of the emission, to check that they are all coming from the same gas and that we don't have different distributions um, depending on the on the isotopic uh, on the isotopologue. And what we find is that for several molecules, we have low isotopic um, ratios, um, especially uh, for CS and methanol for 12C and 13C. But uh, I will also mention the 32S over 34S here that we, also, we could also determine thanks to CS and SO. This is surprising. However, it was already observed in some hot cores, in all, like in some sources also in the, in the low mass regime. So we can rule out the instrumental effects. Um, we could also think um, that the expected isotopic ratios um, were wrong. I mean, we're, we didn't correctly measure them, um, estimated them, sorry and uh, that the source is closer to the galactic center because close to the galactic center, you have lower isotopic ratios. So it could be a solution. However, uh, we, did, uh, we did not, um, the, the distance of the source is it estimated by uh, kinematic um, measurements. So we can um, rule out also this option because the differences are way um, above the, the the error bars. So then we have a possible uh, UV radiation field, uh, which creates um, an enhancement of the, of the rare isotopologues, or we have low temperature isotopic exchange reactions. Here, we cannot say more. We don't know uh, exactly where uh, it comes from. Yeah. 
uh, which is that your, your reference so when you say uh, uh, you are comparing what you get from uh, which kind of uh, measurements? We take the um, the variations with the uh, distance to the galactic center so from. It, it is not uh, something taken in other region of three three hundred twenty eight. No, we don't no, have it's, any. Uh, it's the galactic variations. Uh, variation across uh, yeah. the gaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now I will um, look at the comps. The comps, I told you that we found some in the cold envelope. Um, so it means that we found them around 30 Kelvin. The comps are dissolving like through thermal processes around 100 Kelvin, um, 80 to 100 mm -hmm. Kelvin. It's, uh, it depends on the comps and it's, uh, it's it's also uncertain measurements, but it means that this comes where um, dissolves through non-formal uh, processes. So either it's um, it could be the UV radiation, but it's uh, unlikely here. Um, it could be also uh, shocks or um, cosmic rays or different processes. Um, in the warm envelope, we could also find. Um, almost all the comps. And uh, if we compare to the ALMA study, we have new detections. Um, it's just because the, uh, the ALMA study had a narrow bandwidth and it wasn't suitable to detect uh, dimethylator and uh, CH3SH. Um, also, we have in the comps, we have a clear kinematic of the shocks. It means that we clearly see them, we can uh, resolve them with uh, the the spectral resolution that we have, and uh, we could make a full inventory of the of the molecular content of these shocks, and we have O-bearing molecules in it. We do not detect um, CH3CN or C2H5CN. The complex cyanides are not there. So uh, this is for the comps, and I will come back to it later in the full sample. I told you that we have a six sources in total. So now that we detailed uh, the chemical structure, the molecular structure of uh, G328, we can see the other sources. They are all thought to be in the same um, evolutionary stage, and we want to see if we have a molecular diversity. So here it's the, um, all the detections that we have in all our uh, sources. And you can see that Everything, we have many species in green, which means that they are all, they are detected in all the objects. However, we have some differences and the largest differences are for deuterated molecules, S-bearing molecules and COMs. And um, I would also like to uh, say that we have also many differences on the ions, HC and H plus, we have one here and 2D plus and DCO plus and the S-bearing ions. The only one which is detected everywhere, it's HCS+. It's uh, abundant in all the molecules, but the other ones show differences. Um, it, it's abundant in all the objects, sorry, but the other ones show uh, highlight differences between the objects. So because we have the chemical composition, uh, the molecular composition of all the sources, now we can do exactly the same um, study than what we did on G328. So we can perform LTE modeling of on, all the so, um, on all the molecules in all the sources. And we can come to the same diagram than for G328. So it's, it's here, the object that I showed you before. And you see that in the other objects, we don't have the same um, differentiation between uh, the cold envelope and the warm envelope with the, the line width. So here we will uh, call the warm envelope uh, what is below 50 Kelvin and, sorry, the warm envelope is above 50 Kelvin and the cold envelope is below 50 Kelvin. But we, uh, we can also see here that for this um, source, for example, we have only a few points above 50 Kelvin. Here it's increasing and the, also the, the, the average temperature is, is increasing to 60 Kelvin and it's going up um, in, in the sample. 
So here we have some sources which are extremely cold with an average temperature of 55 Kelvin in the, in the, in the warm end block. So we see an evolution and um, a warm up um, among the, the sample. And we can already see here the emergence of a warm component um, in, in some sources. So it confirms that they are all extremely young and that we do not see uh, the, the warm gas everywhere. So I will come back to the deteriorated molecules. We first compared G328 uh, to, to um, other sources, and now we want to compare all the molecules, uh, all the, the sources um, and um, between themselves. So we see that we keep a low deterioration ratio for all the molecules. So we keep our analysis of, on G328, but we see some um, differences. And in particular, in HCO plus, HCN, and HNC, we see differences. We have also here um, an upper limit. So it means uh, that uh, the, um, we expect something even lower. However, for HD, uh, H2CO and H2CS, all the, um, the sources have a similar deterioration ratio. And this uh, deterioration ratio, and this is um, intriguing because H2CO and H2CS are the two uh, molecules which are supposed to be formed on the grains and then released. So it means that we have the same chemistry until um, H2, HDCO, H2CO, and HDCS and H2CS are formed. Uh, and then they are on the grains. However, in the gas, the chemistry becomes different because we don't have the same deterioration, a deuterium ratio here. So the gas, um, the, the molecular composition of a gas seems different. Now, um, I would like, this is for the, the cold uh, gas, but now I would like to focus on the warm gas and which is traced by the comps. Here you have the excitations, uh, uh, the excitation temperatures for uh, the, the different comps. And in gray here, I indicated uh, the desorption temperatures um, that I found in, in, the, in the literature. So first, um, I would like to, to say that CH3CN, C2H3CN um, are, uh, have, a higher, um, have a higher temperature than all the comps. And we see that the size of the emission is extremely compact and close to the protostar. And this is also what we saw in the ALMA data uh, from TIMEA is that the cyanides are extremely um, compact around the protostars. When the O-bearing molecules and CH3SH uh, have a lower temperature and have larger um, size of emission. So we see a difference between C, uh, the cyanides and the O-bearing uh, molecules. And if we look at the desorption temperatures, we see that the cyanides have a higher temperature in the warm gas. They have higher temperature than the desorption temperature. So we can assume that they, they dissolve through thermal processes. Uh, then we have these molecules, um, which have um, lower, uh, lower excitation temperature than desorption temperature. So we, are, we can be uh, quite certain that they dissolve through non-thermal processes. And then we have the ones which are in the, in the middle, um, where we, we cannot say much. We don't know if it is also for um, non-thermal or thermal processes. And this is interesting because we, is, we see that most of the O-bearing molecules are not uh, fully um, dissolved from the grains. So we are in an intermediate stage and we didn't reach this uh, full, um, the, the full chemistry of hot cores yet. And then this is uh, the, the abundances and the column densities because all these, um, all these objects are uh, quite similar and they have similar uh, H2 column densities. 
So here we will uh, we can compare the, the column densities, and we see that for methanol it's similar in all the objects in the cold and warm gas. However, for other molecules such as CH4 dimethylator and um, methyl formate, it's we have the emergence towards uh, the warmer objects. Uh, we have the emergence of a warm, um, a warm component and of higher column densities uh, in these objects. Uh, this is also the case uh, for formamide, uh, formamide, and also this is the case for the, the cyanides. And uh, I told you that the cyanides were extremely compact, and it means that um, we need to to reach a certain stage and a certain temperature to detect them in the in the cold uh, in the in the warm gas. Um, the so this is a summary of the the detection and of uh, what we see and where because we wanted to see a chemical evolution, and we see here that we have simple molecules in the cold gas and then we have similar detections. However, we see a like gradient and um, an emergence of the molecules uh, along the along the the, the the sample and along the uh, evolution. So, uh, but now I will quickly uh, make a comparison of these objects with uh, the um, with the rest of the um, of the literature and to see. How like how does it compare with uh, the the low mass um, process the low mass formation and the formation of low mass uh, stars and also uh, the high mass uh, and also the hot cores. So here is just we uh, compared the number of lines in all the objects, and this is just to show you that um, we clearly. Uh, here it's also hot corinos and the, the low mass um, se uh, section of uh, the, the low mass stars. Um, and we see that um, in, the, in their comparison, they have two types of objects. It's both hot corinos, but it's, uh, they are different. And we see that all our objects are similar to, to this one rather than this one. So it's the difference between these two objects is the chemistry. So we can assume that we have um, a chemistry closer to, to that one. But we, uh, we can then uh, make a, a, deep, um, a deeper comparison and a more quantitative comparison. This is a comparison of, of the warm gas uh, of our objects with the warm gas of hot corinos. So here, unfortunately, it doesn't show the um, the a gray shaded ar area, but it shows you that all these points, these ones and these ones are similar uh, in both uh, objects. They are within a factor five, and this is, um, this is the, the error bars that we expect. However, these ones are different. And these ones, they uh, show that it's the cyanides and the C2H5. Um, molecule. Therefore, uh, in both of these examples, we can see that the complex cyanides are different between um, uh, our objects and hot corinos. This is interesting. It means that our objects are similar in the warm gas except for the cyanides. Here we compare to, to hot cores and to the um, Sagittarius um, B2 N2 hot core. And we see that we have more dispersion. So we are still missing the, the gray area, but um, all these points are away and these ones as well. So we have a larger diversity and we cannot see a, like a trend like we saw in, um, for, for the hot corinos. So we have a larger dispersion. This is for the molecular abundances. So on a molecular point of view, we are similar to both of, of both objects, but we, it's, it goes more towards the hot corinos. Now, if we compare the physical 
um, parameters, we have a temperature and the size of the hot component. So first, this, the, the temperatures. Here, we, we have, um, we, we compare with uh, hot cores and with uh, like the, the two hot cores that I showed you before. And we see that the temperature of the hot cores uh, are uh, higher than what we observe in our uh, objects. However, except for the cyanides, uh, however, for the O-bearing molecules, we see that we are similar to hot corinos. It means that we have a temperature in the hot envelope, which is similar to what we observe in the low mass uh, star forming regi regime. And it's uh, not, it's lower than what we observe in hot cores, so in the high mass um, regime. And when we compare the sizes, however, we are a bit lower than what we observe in hot cores. However, we are um, much larger than what we observe in hot corinos. So this is, it looks like a compact hot core on this point of view. And then we come to the, to the cold uh, gas. And we see that um, here I will compare only to IRAS uh, 16 to 93, because this is where I had the largest uh, um, database and uh, the most complete database. And we see that it's uh, similar. Unfortunately, the gray area is still missing. And uh, all um, points are following the, are within the uh, factor of five error bars. Um, so we see that we have a cold gas, which is also similar in molecular abundances to hot corinos. Uh, we could not, we, sorry, we could not compare to hot cores because we didn't have uh, such measurements and, uh, in the literature. Now I will uh, just present um, some cor correlation between the cyanides and the protostar um, properties. So first, the luminosity, uh, we, used, uh, we used it to, to, to compare and we see a trend for higher, um, uh, we, we see a trend that we have more complex cyanides such as C2H5Cn towards the, the higher uh, luminosity. And we use then the L over M ratio because it, um, it's supposed to uh, explain the, um, the evolution and the star evolution. So we are, we are supposed to, tra to trace star evolution and we see once again, a trend uh, between the, uh, the, the cyanides and the, the, the evolution. So then we can see that we have some uh, correlation, correlations between the molecular composition uh, of the cyanides and the, the physical properties of the source. So I will come to uh, my conclusions. So first we were able to have a uh, full inventory of six uh, sources. Um, it's, it provides a database and we were able to have, um, to separate the cold and warm uh, gas components. Um, we also see that we, we are able to distinguish the uh, physics of the source, uh, even with single dish data. And then we see that even though the molecular content of the sources looks, uh, looks similar, um, we have some differences. And um, we see also here that thanks to these differences, we can trace the emergence of uh, the, the warm gas. However, um, we, we cannot, uh, for, um, for now we cannot see the, we can only say that we have some um, chemical processes, which are not the ones that we are used to in the, in the hot cores. However, we, for now, just with this, uh, with this study, um, we cannot uh, certainly say, uh, we cannot say with certainty where uh, the molecules are coming from. And finally, uh, the comparison, it shows that we have some objects which will form hot cores 
which will be um, uh, which will form high mass stars that are in fact similar to hot corinos. They have the same uh, cold gas molecular abundances. They have similar um, molecular abundances in the warm gas, except for the cyanides. Um, they have the same temperature. However, they are much larger and much more massive than hot corinos. And uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the characteristic uh, the, the, on these characteristics, they are more similar to hot cores. Um, so maybe we uh, this hot core precursor uh, stage is uh, in fact a deeply embedded hot corino. Uh, they are um, deeply embedded hot corinos. And then, um, uh, however, we need to be extremely careful because this depends on the tracer that we are using. We have all bearing molecules and we have cyanides. The cyanides cannot, can be used to characterize maybe if the, we have low mass protostars or high mass protostars. However, um, we need a more complete uh, sur survey and we need a survey, a surveys targeting and analyzing in the same way. Uh, low mass and high mass protostars with large bandwidth to have a complete view um, of the chemical composition. Thanks. Yes, questions. Yes. Uh, so uh, when you, when you speak of the difference of uh, cyanide with respect to the other molecules, I've seen uh, several diagrams where you use the relative ratio of passive cyanide to massive cyanide. Uh, do you have also a comparison of uh, cyanides directly with uh, overbearing uh, molecules? And uh, what would be the result? Yes. Um, when we compare, so um, do you want to know the, the comparison with the luminosity or just the molecular abundances? When molecular we abundances. So this is uh, also different. Um, this is, uh, we also have a, a difference when we make the ratio with uh, demethylator. And uh, this is increased. Here I showed uh, the ratios with uh, CH3CN because then we try to, to see if it is a clear separation or just like a difference between cyanides and ovarian molecules. So um, it's, it gives the same results for the cyanides. And then I have also uh, another question. Uh, in the categories of molecules you presented, you do you do not put uh, ketan and uh, ketan and uh, formaldehyde in the common uh, group. Uh, are there important reasons for that? So ketan is because it has five atoms. Yeah, it has five, five atoms only. CCO. The final was a six. Six. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It just, we need to, to make the cut. What was like, uh, it's uh, Van de Schoek and Herbst in 2009 said that the comps are like from six atoms. It just, you need to make the cut somewhere. Yes, uh, yeah. uh, my mistake was because I, I usually don't count uh, so much the hydrogen when comparing molecules. Yeah. The small carbon and oxygen, which is a competition. Yeah. We, we could put them and we could make a comparison. However, H2CCO is not always um, given in the, in the molecular inventories because here we try to um, keep, to take only studies with um, similar, um, with consistent ab approach, sorry, approaches, uh, which means that they needed to be studied in the same way to be taken with uh, like to limit the number of telescopes also and this kind of thing. So we don't, we can't have all the molecules and all these constraints, it's so far we do not find them. That's okay. why we need larger programs. But that, that doesn't mean that they are chemically uh, very in a different way. It's more practical uh, reason or uh, an arbitrary definition. Yeah. Other questions or comments or I don't know thoughts. Uh... 
Okay, well, if not, then thank you very much for listening to, uh, to Laura today. And uh, thank you also to those who were online. Uh, we are going to close the seminar for today. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>